Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone tonight. Um, this is our second in two webinars on beginning to look at birds. Um, for those of you who may not know, um, in pre-COVID times, you know how we used, we still talk about pre-K and post-K, so now we're going to have pre-COVID and post-COVID. Um, in pre-COVID times, Jennifer and I team taught a beginning bird watching class about this 50 people, okay. where we had, um, we had two classroom classes where we went over various things about birding, bird watching, and, and equipment, and um, technological things, and ornithological things. And then we had a few field guides afterwards, which I do believe Joan and Joelle led some field guides for our students. And I have to say, as a testament to those classes, we produce some avid birders now from those classes. So I was just thinking this morning, I am so hoping that this COVID goes its merry way, wherever it's gonna go, and we could have those classes again. Um, they were great. I met great people. I learned a lot and they were really, it was fun. So I'd like to do those again. So in lieu of that, since we can't um, get together as a group, we're doing these. So I um, first would like to thank Joan Garvey and Ken Harris for the use of some of their photographs. Um, they're both great uh, photographers. Um, we should give them a round of applause, both Joan and Ken, because photographing warblers is not easy. I think I have a, a, an easier time learning how to ride a unicycle than trying to photograph warblers. So it's very difficult. Um, so I applaud them. So thank you for that. So one of the things that I, I think about every September as a birder, and I have since 1997, is this thing called confusing fall warblers. And for some people, it's not so much of a big deal. They don't see the confusion. For other folks, they have a bit of trouble. And I thought, well, for beginners who are learning to bird watch now in the fall, what are they thinking? Are they thinking, oh, here are all these birders are making big deals about these beautiful birds, and look at that thing. That thing is as drab as it can get. So I thought, well, why don't we have a program, a webinar, where we can talk about what happens with warblers, why some people like me, I call myself a warbler-holic, okay? Um, and Jennifer, I was going to ask you this, and by the way, I am going to refer all scientific questions to Jennifer. I am not a scientist. I don't play one on television. I am a retired English professor. In fact, I retired in May from Delgado. So, but I'm a warbler lover. So if you have any really scientific or highly technical questions, I'm going to refer those to Jennifer. Um, so I thought we would do this. So let's take a little trip down and, and study some warblers and see what we've got. Um, oops, I got to do it this way. So why do we love warblers? Okay, and for beginners, they want to know what is it about warblers? Well, first of all, they're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful. Um, your prothonotary warbler here, a nester in the area. Um, in fact, in 1997, when I was uh, volunteering out at uh, Barataria on the Coquille Trail, 1997 in the spring, I remember this as clear as day, I was walking down the trail, minding my own business, picking up some litter as good volunteers for the National Park Service do, and I was whistling, and I must have been whistling in a way that aggravated this male prothonotary. It dive bound my head. I felt these little scratchy things on my head, and not being a birder yet, I freaked out. I said, what in the world was that? Here I am in the swamp, this girl from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm in the swamp. What am I doing? And I looked up and there the prothonotary, the male was, and oh, he was just going to town. It was like being yelled at by a bird. And I was transfixed. 1997. And much to my spouse's dismay, it's been like that ever since. So uh, I, they are gorgeous. Um, they are some of the most colorful birds we have here in the U.S. and Canada. You'll see yellows, a variety of colors, from mustard yellow to, to this prothonotary's yellow, um, blues, 
oranges even, greens, a variety of greens. And if you go out west and you get the uh, red starts out there, you'll even see some reds. So um, they're just beautiful and they present a challenge. And you know, let's face it, as I'm getting older, my brain is not as plastic as it used to be, but the hand-to-eye coordination that's required to look for warblers is helping me. So as I'm watching warblers and, and I, I've, I've been birding for a while and I please, and those of you who know me, you know I am no expert. I don't even pretend to be an expert, but I, I kind of know the field marks that I'm looking for, but it's so helpful for the brain. So this challenge is, is good. And the challenge comes from what we're gonna talk about today. And that's the seasonal plumage changes, okay? Now, many species of warblers can only be found in the eastern half of the United States. I have friends in Montana, Colorado, and Alaska, and one in uh, New Mexico. They all laugh at me. Oh, gosh, you get one breeding hummingbird in the summer. Woo, look at all the hummingbirds we get. I said, yeah, but you've got like what? You know, how many warblers do you have? We have the warblers. Um, so we are very lucky in the east to have uh, the lion's share of the warblers. And then the one thing that I think anybody who bird watches can really marvel at is this mystery of migration. You can put three warblers in one of those white envelopes and what, put a first class postage stamp on it, a forever stamp and mail it off. They're so light, their bones are hollow. Um, but I can hardly walk to the Bonneville boat launch and back without looking miserable. These birds fly across the Gulf of Mexico. I'm not saying without trouble or without getting tired, but I mean, I couldn't fly across the Gulf of Mexico even if I wanted to. So it's just that mystery of migration. So right now, for those of us who are really new to birding, we are now in the throes of fall migration. So um, birds that come up through the spring, they go up and they, you know, they come up through the Gulf Coast and they disperse to their different nesting uh, areas. And then when all the nesting's done and the parenting's done, they all come down. And that's the one issue we have in the fall with warblers is not only are we getting mom and dad back, the parents, but we're getting all the offspring too. And the offspring often don't look like the parents. So migration in the fall is different than it is in the spring. So just a few warbler facts to think about. There are 115 species of New World warblers. More than half occur north of Mexico. Um, not that Mexico does not have great warblers. It, do, it does, rather. Um, the eastern half of the United States, as we've already said, sees the most diversity. Most warblers are highly migratory, so they'll breed in, you know, what, in Manitoba or north of, uh, of uh, north of Cleveland, where I'm from, in Ontario, and what have you, and then they will return their various routes to their Mexican or Central American or Caribbean, in some cases South American, as in the black pole warbler, um, which is a fascinating migratory story. If you want to, if you're interested in migration, um, uh, Scott Weedensall has this book, isn't it? Uh -huh. Seasons on the Wind. I cannot remember the name. I'm sorry about that, but Scott Wiedensaw has got a great book about migration, and he discusses at length the black pole warbler. And we'll look at that word in a minute, so don't worry about spelling it. And then um, what's interesting to me, and Jennifer can speak at length about this, obviously, is that warblers will migrate at night so as to avoid those predators. And Jennifer, am I right about this? From what I understand, Accipiters, raptor species such as um, Cooper's hawks and Sharpshin, have timed their migration with the warbler migration. Is that? They're geniuses. <laughs> well, they're yeah, simultaneous, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, that they they, they want to make sure that their migration is well fueled. Yep. Yeah. Well we warbler lovers we understand that we may not still like it but so um the warblers are flying at night and warblers don't warble that was the first thing i kind of like wait a minute why were they called warblers and i have never stopped to look that up but um they don't warble um they have two vocalizations and i don't want to get technical about this but they have songs and they have call notes 
And we don't hear the songs now because there's nothing to sing about because they're done with all of that. Call notes you will be hearing. In fact, Joan and uh, Mark and I let, yesterday were talking about the call notes of the American Red Start and the Black Throated Green and the sound qualities of those. And that's what you're hearing now. And, and before I forget, um, I, I do want to suggest that if you are starting out at this thing called bird watching and you do want to get into warblers, tomorrow morning try to get to Couturier Woods or the Wisner Tract because um, you'll hear some call notes. Call, you'll hear some warblers um, issuing these call notes. You won't know what they are, but at least you'll get to hear the sound. And then when, I, when we talk about apps and things like that, you could look these things up and do some research. So um, we know that they have songs. These are complex songs. You know, we know that males sing mostly. Um, they serve as female attractants, right? The stronger your song, the more varied your songs, the more uh, attractive you are. We also, songs are also territory advisement, ad advertisements. This is my tree, this is my tree, this is my tree kind of thing. They come in the form of trills, buzzes and whistles. Um, uh, and then what's interesting is the songs that we hear in the spring may have started earlier in the, uh, in the winter when they were in Central America or Mexico or Costa Rica. Um, I had a, the great privilege of hearing some prothonotary singing in um, uh, Michoacan, Mexico one year. Mm -hmm. 17 years or so ago and it's sort of like wow you know because that was not something I was accustomed to but that's indeed when they they can start um, call notes chip notes they can be metallic -y sounding they can be soft or hard sounding and one thing I really like about this time of the year is that if you're out at night and one of our fellow board members, Peter Yawkey, is really great at this, is listening to the flyover notes, the flight notes that the birds will issue when they're flying um, at night. I often mostly hear thrush um, flight notes. I've not been fortunate enough to hear warbler flight notes. I do have a video here, folks. I'm hoping it's working. I, again, I am not technological in any way. I'm very right-brained. Um, I think that's right. Is that right, right brain? But if there are a few seconds of commercials, bear with me. But what here I have is a video of a very common warbler that's here year round and two great places to see this warbler. It's one of my favorites. One reason it's one of my favorites is because it doesn't change from spring to fall. Um, it, it may get look worn a little bit, but you'll recognize what it is in the fall. And the other thing I like about it so much is that it's so easy to find. You can go to the Barataria Preserve. Boy, I'm really doing a lot of shout outs for the Barataria Preserve, but you can walk the Coquille Trail. And as you're going down that Coquille Trail, just before you're about to get to the benches right near the Marsh Overlook Trail, the uh, common yellow throats have colonized those that reedy area with uh, the cattails and what have you, and they issue these call notes all year round, so you can hear them. And females do it too. But the other place you could see them pretty pretty um, easily is in on the Wisner Tract. There, um, you have to be quiet, of course. And my rule of thumb is. The more you talk, the less you're going to see. And that's why my husband loves to go bird watching with me because that's when I'm the quietest. But um, if you walk the cement trails on the Wisner Tract and you see all these brushy areas, they were vocalizing big time on Monday when I was out there. Okay, so let's see if this works. And, uh, oh. Okay, so what we're going to hear first is a commercial. What we're going to hear first is call notes and then the song. Okay, uh, sorry about this part. Can y'all hear that? Song. 
call note. And look at the way this bird flits. That's what we do when we're warblers. See the mask? Look at the yellow undertail. That's a diagnostic right there. More song. And so call note and song um, happen, you know, in the same uh, length of time, I guess. I'm, I don't know the technical term for that. Anyway, so that's one of my favorites simply because it is kind of easy to find. It's here year round and it's pretty. It's very pretty. Okay. Um, uh, Jennifer, I was thinking of you yesterday. I was thinking, oh my gosh, this bird is a rufous collared sparrow from Peru. And I thought, well, I like the picture so much, but I'm, I'm going to use it anyway. Okay, so folks, this is a South American bird. But one thing, and again, I don't want everybody to get, get technical and things here, but too technical rather. But one thing you want to be able to do is figure out some of the fields. Uh, characteristics, the, the, the identification characteristics, the things in the bird that you can say, oh yeah, it had that supercilium. Some people just say eyebrow, right? You don't have to say supercilium. It had a yellow eyebrow or the eye line, if we can see the eye line here in this bird, right? The eye line. A lot of birds do have this, have an eye line right? You don't have to say auricular, you could say ear patch if you want. Um, Jennifer, how many times a day do you say auricular? Zero. Okay, all right, there you have it. See, <laughs> so you don't have to worry about things like that. I, don't, I know Joan does not walk around saying auricular, but uh, anyway, so you want to be able to know some of these markings that you're seeing um, on the bird. Birds have chins, yes, right here. So is there a yellow chin? Um, again, this is a sparrow. It's not even a North American species, but many warblers do have patterning on the back. So you want to notice that, okay? So these things are, are things you want to be able to do, uh, see rather, crown stripes. Was there a stripe on the crown of the head? Was there a head stripe? Were there two head stripes, okay? So things like that. And then, I'm, I apologize for the size of this font here, but then your wings. You want to notice what's on the wings. And with warblers, most of the time it's going to be your wing bars, right? They'll have wing um, stripes on their wings, white wing bars. Some warblers, like the black-throated blue warbler, which only really comes through here in the spring, and that's even a rare bird to come through, will have a white handkerchief on its wing. My friend calls it a white handkerchief. But anyway, these things you have time to learn and these things you will learn over reading and things. So your primaries, your secondaries, your tertials and all the coverts and things like that. But when someone says to you, oh, look at the wing bar on the whatever, you'll kind of have an idea of what's being said, okay? So you don't have to get, you can get as technical as you want, or you can get not technical, it's all up to you. But I wanted to look at this, and this is Joan's shot. So a shout out to Joan, look at this beautiful shot here. And I wanted us, and I'm not gonna ask Jennifer to unmute us, because that could invite mayhem. So I'm just gonna go along with you. So you go along with me, I'll go along with you. I want you to see markings here. So if we're looking at the head first, and I'm just looking at face patterns right now, do we see, and you could shake your heads, do you see a supercilium? Do you see what might be an eyebrow? Is it orange in color? Okay, so if you said to someone, it looked like it had an orange stripe above its eye, that tells someone like Jennifer or Joelle or Joan and maybe me on a good day, what that bird might be, okay? Uh, if you also say, yeah, but it had an orange eyebrow and then it had this black line through its eye, that might tell us more. But if you go through and study your field guides, which we'll look at a bit later, if you look at your field guides, if someone is leading you on a trip and they say, oh yeah, that's a black Bernian, 
then you know some of these things because you've looked at your field guide. Now, mind you, this is spring blackbirding. Um, he is getting himself ready to do what birds do in the springtime, right? Birds do it, bees do it, even educated fleas do it. So this, they are getting ready, and this is the breeding plumage that you're going to be seeing. Now, we saw some this morning in the fall plumage, and these birds are not confusing fall warblers because many still have, it's, it may be yellow, but it's kind of got a, it's really yellow on some, but it's kind of got an orangey tint to it, and it's kind of got the face pattern still. So if the bird is cooperative enough and you can get a good look at it, you'll be able to see that. Now, I will say one thing about bird photographers and all of you out there who are photographers that are, that are, you're lucky because you can go home, Joan can go home, Ken can go home and look at their photographs and say, oh yeah, that's what it is. Well, folks like me, we just have to rely on what it is that we saw and hope that we got it correct. Okay. All right. It's always to look, it's always good to look beneath the bird. And many times a butt shot is all you're going to get. Okay. Um, uh, in, in Couturier, um, I sprang my neck this morning. So I was walking literally with my head down because I did this the whole morning, which is what we call warbler neck. And I got a bunch of butt shots. But because I can kind of tell some of the undertail and the tail patterns, you can figure out what some of these, these uh, warblers are. And so the ones I want to look at right now are in the second row. And one, two, three, four on the right side. Okay, so the four on the right side here, because these are all, they're coming through now. And it's pretty significant, not that any of these others aren't significant, but these are pretty significant, significant for a couple reasons. And one is this magnolia. I don't consider a magnolia a really confusing fall warbler because you can kind of, if you've seen enough of them, you can kind of know, okay, that's a, a non-breeding male. But the one diagnostic is this, right? You see this and you get that good butt shot and you're standing on the trail right by the lagoon in Couturier and you're looking up in that hackberry tree and what you see is this and you know right away it's a, a magnolia warbler. I'm happy with that. I have a friend back home in Cleveland who's been birding for 50 years. She's not happy. She wants to see the whole bird. Me, I get a good butt shot. I can identify it. I'm happy. Okay, now the next, um, I'm going to keep palm for a minute, but the next, these two right here, the American Red Star, look how characteristic that tail is. And look how unique it is compared to everything else on this sheet. Um, and this comes from a book that Joan and Mark and I were talking about yesterday that I'll probably have to break down and buy. I, and we'll talk about field guides, but I use the Petersons, but I think I may have to breakdown is Mark was telling me that it gives you all different angles of looking at the warbler so I'll have to do it but look at these two and that's your American Red Star we have um, you know this bird in the fall or in, I'm sorry in the spring that's black and orange and gorgeous and its tail indicates to you what it is and also its behavior which we'll look at in a minute Okay, the one in the middle here is the palm warbler, and I kind of like the palm war warbler because it's kind of like yellow, white, yellow. So if you're looking at uh, from underneath the tree, yellow, white, yellow. Now, palm warblers don't necessarily go high up in the tree, so you're not likely. I I've never seen a total under uh, cover tail of a palm warbler, but that, that doesn't mean it hasn't happened. But these are great to look at, and I should, um, some of these, the yellows, you see yellow's going to be all yellow, right? Black and white. So I would probably, you could get, download this offline, print it out, and do a bit of studying on it, because it definitely will help. Okay, so let's take a look at some um, of these warblers with uh, some field marks um so that we know what they are and i want to start down here okay 
so this is a good, well, not a good, I'm not going to say, it's, it's a rare, right? A rare, uncommon, not rare, uncommon spring migrant. But in the east, I mean, I'm sorry, in the fall, they fly, they migrate farther east, right, of us. Cape May warbler, what do you see? What's the most obvious thing your eyeballs fall on? I would think the reddish orangish ear patch. Maybe some of you might say the, the streaks on the breast. Some of you might say the black eye line. Okay. Um, it's up to you, whatever helps you, but you want to be able to get those characteristics down and say to yourself, okay, well, the Kate May, it's Kate May, but Kate May has this orange patch on its face. So it's not going to help you in the fall unless you're in Florida. If you're going to go visit your Aunt Hilda in Jacksonville or something, you might, you might run into one in the fall. Okay, but these others, these three others are species we saw see in the fall um much to the dismay of some birders but these two you can see right now so our northern parala gorgeous bird right and your eyes are drawn to a couple things right away so your eyes naturally focus in i mind you on color so I'd say that the breast is very significant. I want to know that breast. I want to know the bicolor, the black necklace, the orange, the yellow orange throat. Um, this is not a good shot for this bird, but knowing its eye ring. Some birds have white eye rings that go completely around. Some have broken eye rings. Some don't have white eye rings or eye rings at all. Okay, so you can see a faint hint in this bird of an eye ring. Now, this is, again, not often the way you're going to see this warbler. They, they, they're moving constantly, okay, except for this one. I find that I'm always asking, why do you not flit about when everybody else does? A yellow rumped warbler, geez, you think, but you got to be careful because there are several warblers with yellow rump, so you can't just see a yellow rump and say, oh, it's a yellow rumped warbler. This is a yellow rumped warbler, but you want to notice wing bars, they may be faint, the streaking on the back. What patterning are you seeing in the eyes? What are you seeing in, around the eyes? But of course, this, you know, if you've got everything else, you've got faint streaks in the breast, and you got that, and it's going check, 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 when you know you've got a yellow rump. Okay, um, this, I think I was telling you, Joan, the other day, this is one of my favorite warblers. And some of you, ooh, ooh, I think it's gorgeous. I think that buffy, peachy color is gorgeous. Um, but you see, what do you see here? So you see these diagnostic um, characteristic, these ID things that will help you. Okay, the eye line, the supercilium, the crown stripe. Um, Okay, and a rather um, buffy bird altogether. Okay, so get yourself some, some good uh, notebooks or no notes or something so that when you do see these and you could write them down because I told my students for 30 years, I, my mother always told me, if you write things down, we're going to remember them. Okay, and that's what I had to do. I had a notebook. This is before these things and these things and I had a notebook and I sat and wrote down, well, um, the worm-eating warbler has, you know, a black eye line and it's really pretty peachy colored and so forth and so on. Okay, sometimes birds don't change in the uh, spring, from the spring to the fall, they don't change much at all. And again, um, these are some Jones shots. So this bird, you know, the uh, yellow, Throated warbler, you can see it in the fall. It looks pretty similar. Thank God for small miracles. Um, but you, again, notice some of the qualities of this bird. And for me, it's that yellow throat, but you have to be careful because you don't want to run into that black birdie and warbler make the same mistake. Um, this, this guy, another one of my favorites. I love these ground dwelling, um, skulking warblers. Uh, this is an oven bird, but look at the, the crown stripes, right? 
And my friend from Cleveland texted me a photo that she got of one. And it was a, from what she could determine, I, I'm not quite sure how she could. She thought it was a male, but she wasn't sure, but it didn't have an orange crown stripe. But um, are, don't females and males, Jennifer, Joan, Joel, all have the orange crown stripe? Don't they? So this one had no orange crown stripe, none whatsoever. It's interesting. But the, the uh, streaky chest, right? Eye ring, okay? And of course, this guy, which is very common out of Baratari in the Kentucky. So I gave you just kind of a little list of thing, birds that don't change much, that aren't gonna cause you much trouble. Yesterday we saw a hooded warbler that was a little worn, but that's not the same thing. I mean, bird feathers get worn. I mean, we get worn, why wouldn't bird feathers get worn? But um, here again, this is Ken's photo of a black burning in the sunlight. Look at that, I mean, it's just absolutely incredible. But um, they're going to retain some of the same plumage markings so that you can ID it well, okay? And so will some of these. Okay, so again, these are some of them that won't uh, change much. Okay, and then the, this one, to me, doesn't pose many problems. It could be because I've been looking at it for so long. But our black-throated green warbler, okay, male breeding, female breeding, immature. But you could still, even, even if you have an immature, and that's part of the problem we'll look at in a second, is you could still see some of the markings. That funky, greeny, blacky on the head. Okay, excuse my technical terms there. Okay, so what makes it so difficult to ID fall warblers? Well, again, they go through molt. Uh, so they, some radically change appearance. Yeah, from spring to fall, obviously making it difficult. It's also a mix of fall females and immatures, both male and female immatures that create a challenge for us. In the fall, warblers tend to hide in the foliage more so, and especially in the interior of the canopy of a tree because of those migrating raptors. Males aren't singing, so there's nothing to sing about, so you won't necessarily be able to identify them if you're going by song. And then did I mention warbler neck? It is a pain. I am sure I'm going to need a chiropractic visit after this week. You know, it's, it's painful, it is. Okay, so let's take a look at some birds that are easy to confuse with warblers and that I know when I started out, I said, oh, that's a warbler. No, that really wasn't a warbler. It was a kinglet. So um, I love this photo of Ken's. It's one of my favorite wintering species. It's a blue-headed vireo, but you can see some folks might mistake its size. Oh, it's got wing bars, but it's not. And if you look at its bill and, and you have seen these birds with folks out into the field, they'll tell you that's a vireo. A vireo has these these characteristics, blah, blah, blah. Another, um, uh, I'm sorry, did I say a vireo? I did say blue-headed vireo, sorry. Another bird that's gonna be coming down soon is this guy, um, and you could very faintly see it's, or it's a ruby crown on the top. It's ruby crown kinglet, right? But it's not a warbler. And they're even a little more hyperactive to me than warblers. And this is a bird you're probably, you might be seeing now, um, the blue-gray gnatcatcher. Again, a great shot of Ken's, and I'm assuming, Ken, you must have gotten this in the winter, as I'm not seeing any tree, any leaves, so, um, but often mistaken. And then sometimes this happens. Um, it's most frustrating. These come from a great website from the Black Swamp Bird Observatory up in McGee Marsh. Uh, it's called Butt Shots, and so um, they have a whole page of warbler butts, okay? So this one's kind of, if you're used to warblers, it's black and white. It's not too difficult to tell, but look at this one. How many warblers have white undertail and maybe a white portion on its belly? So you got to see more of the bird. This one, oh, you're quick and you say, oh, that's a uh, yellow rumped warbler. Okay, it's not. This one's my favorite. I'm gonna pay 
uh, let's see, we'll go $1.50 for anyone who can identify this warbler. I'm thinking, I, I, I don't know what I'm thinking. To me, that's just sheer obnoxiousness because I can't identify that thing. And then this black thread green hiding in the lighting here, which could be really difficult to see. So these are some of the reasons they're not here for us, okay? Um, no matter how we might like to think that. Okay, so the plumages, I'm not gonna get into that. Molt's really technical, and you could really study molt if you want, but we know that birds molt and it requires a lot of energy, so they're not gonna do it when they're breeding because they need all the energy for that, and they're not gonna do it when they're, if they're migrating because they need all the energy for that. I'm not gonna get into any of these technical terms, and there are so many different terms to use, but I just like to say first fall, so when, um, let's say a, um, an American Red Star is, ha is hatched in June. The September after is a first fall plumage. It, it, it doesn't still have any of its hatchling plumage, but it's not quite totally male yet, or totally adult, I meant to say totally adult yet, okay? So I thought this was kind of cool for those of you who have never maybe seen a bird with worn feathers. Feathers take a toll. I mean, I mean, a life takes a toll on feathers and how worn they can be because of bay-breasted warbler. Again, with that diagnostic tail pattern that you can see. Okay, so our challenge number one, thankfully, is not a bird that comes through here in the fall, but I understand that we did have someone see a black pole in Bayou Sauvage earlier in the week. Okay, these are two different shots. Ken and Jones birds both do good things, and I like them both for these reasons. Let's start with Ken's. Okay, so on the left is a springtime male black pole warbler. Springtime. I'm in the mood for love, singing, 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 right? Okay. Let's notice some things about this bird on the wings. We notice that. We might notice it's got kind of a black cap. A lot of people mistake chickadees. I was guilty of that, thinking on Grand Isle. I was just seeing a chickadee, and it was indeed a black pole warbler about 20 years ago. Um, the white, notice this, and this is why I like Ken's photograph. See the color of that lower mandible? Ooh, it's yellow. Okay, now. What do you think happens in the fall? Because Mother Nature can do that. The ma lower mandible darkens a little bit. This all goes away. Look at this. And this is the big thing about black poles, isn't it? Look at the color of the yet legs. How many warblers have legs that chic? Look at that color. Okay. What do you think happens in the fall? Joan's picture, on the other hand, gives us some good looks at the wing bars, the black cap, and you notice there's no eye ring on this bird, right? And then look at the black patterning. Now, I'll ask you, what's the likelihood, unless you're Joan or Ken or another great photographer, of which I am discovering on LOS's Facebook page, if you're not on, you need to get on because there are so many great bird photographers in this state. Look at the black patterning, but how often do you think you're going to get to see that? Unless you photograph these, these birds. Okay, so this is our first challenge, okay? All right. Again, thankfully, they don't come through in the fall. Our, my friend in Alaska said he watches them leave from his home in Alaska. They, these birds, it's phenomenal, fly across Canada to the maritime provinces down the east coast all the way almost all sometimes as far as south america that bird so when i'm walking to the bonneville boat launch tomorrow i'm going to be a little more um, you know, forthright and have a little more gusto about it all right so here we have our fall transformation of that look at that let's go back that beauty becomes that and that's why so many folks have difficulty with fall warblers. So again, if you're on the East Coast anywhere, if you're going up to Nova Scotia in early September or mid-September, 
you may find some of these, but what do you see right away? What's the common denominator that you see? Aha! Okay, one thing I can see right away, even on the female, right? Wing bars, but what happens to all that beautiful? And look at the color change. Okay, so that's why we want to be very careful and get these IDs down too. And also with the with the black pole and our next bird, I would look at the bill very carefully too. But look what happens. Looks a little, excuse me, looks a little yellow. But I want you to note this color, that kind of lime green on this juvenile, I meant to call it immature folks, but uh, this limey green color. You don't want to mistake that for something else that we'll be seeing up soon. Okay, challenge number two. I, I'm thinking these don't necessarily fly through either, right? They take a more easterly co uh, track in the fall. Is that true, Jennifer? Sometimes. But look, again, look at the color changes. Uh, um, Joan's photo here, all right? Look at the gorgeous bay color. And that's not a color name we hear too often, but look at that. Look at that gorgeous, rich, rich color on the contour feathers here. All right. And the yellowish, palish yellow backing and the wing. And look what you notice here. Okay. In the, in the back of it. But, and this is the breeding female. So you could still, she does still have some of that bay color. But look what happens. So if you were to see this bird, let's go back for a second. This bird, this bird, you have to be able to detect, hopefully, some of this bay color, okay? And I see a little bit of a black eye line that might be retained from that. Look how she is. Look at that lime green. This, this lime green seems to be the in fashion color for fall. Their spring migration is a little west of us. Okay. They're here, we have them in fall. Okay, good, thank you. Maybe it's just because I never get to see them, probably. So, which is which? Okay, so this is on the left. Difficult because you don't have a look at the other one's feet, All right? But let's just take a look again. Let's just look at the bill here. See the bill? This is such a pronounced bill, right? And what's the likelihood if you photographed it, you'll be able to look at that, okay? Do you see any bay color here, faintly? Okay. So, bay breasted, black pole. Is this not confounding from what they were in the spring? Okay. And if you look at them, I, I believe this is a spring shot, but look at the undertail and you can see, right? See that bay color? Okay. And what clue do you get here? Look at that very tiny glimpse of those feet. But again, it's going to take a little bit of studying to be able to capture all this. Okay, this is a challenge that you're going to be seeing, you'll be probably encountering in a bit, okay? Uh, orange crowned warblers are not here yet, but Ken's photo does show you a good job of how drab this bird is. I would not say this bird wins a Miss Bird contest or Mr. Bird's not the most beautiful warbler, um, but folks, I live in a section of Metairie that, I'm sorry, I should not say this, but I call it the we hate trees section of Metairie because everybody seems to be chopping down their trees on my street. Um, in fact, we have a neighbor who just rebuilt a house and cut half of his neighbor's live oak off. Um, I don't know how that happened, but we just discovered that the other day. But I have a neighbor who is very fond of her oak tree and she leaves it alone. I have these all winter. And when we quickly move to plants and talk about plants, I'll tell you something that happens with these orange crown. But you can see in Ken's photo, there is that uh, yellowish supercilium. 
you can see this kind, you don't see this hardly ever, but this orange crown, right? And a very dull wash. And here's the bird that it's often confused with, the Tennessee warbler. And it's not confused with a spring Tennessee warbler, right? Super psyllium, bug juice, uh, maybe an eyebrow, the gray head, this lovely green. Remember our refrigerators and stoves in the 60s and 70s with this avocado green? Um, but the big thing again is the butt shots. So your orange crown is going to have yellow to its undertail, through its undertail. So yellow, white, yellow. Whereas the Tennessee is going to have this white undertail covered. So if you if you see these birds and you get them confused, you can always look at the butts and get your ID that way. Okay, so which is which? Let's go back real quickly. Um, here we have the Tennessee. It's got a white undertail covered. Here we have the orange crown, which is really kind of drab. It's got a yellowish supercilium, where this has got a black eye line and a white supercilium. And, it's got a yellow undertail. So, which is which? And I threw one in there just to confuse you. Which has the white undertail, which has the yellow, and you'll figure that one out. So our orange crown and our Tennessee. And by the way, our female common yellow throat, which often gets confused for these birds, but she's yellow all the way through. So you have to notice these things, but these three birds are often commonly confused by folks. Challenge number four is not really a challenge if you don't care about sexing the birds. Um, so here we have, I believe this is Joan's photograph. Um, is that bird not gorgeous? It looks like fire, okay? This is an American red start. Um, and you see the tail pattern, which is very clearly indicative of the species. Here it is in fall. I saw one today that was really just sort of drabber version of itself. That's not the problem. The problem is here. This is a female, immature female, breeding female, who knows, but this, and this is why I'm kind of interested. This is an immature first year fall. And how do we know that it's not her? Well, we know because the immature males will have these black specklings. And notice the black around the eye. So it's, it will return next year with all of the black, but it's going to have that. Now, I've had fairly good luck with finding um, red starts. Splotchy male red starts is what I call them. Okay, my husband said that this is a beautiful bird to him. So, hey, if you just like looking at females and knowing that that's a beautiful bird, that's fine. It's all a matter of what you want to do with birding. Okay, today chestnut sided everywhere it seemed to be in the park. Um, Ken's photograph is spring. Notice what you're going to notice is the yellow crown. This gorgeous chestnut color, which I think it's just as bay as bay is, but the white patch, okay? And again, this is a good way you might see one of these birds, spring and fall. Um, Joan's picture, Joan, I am going to assume this is a female, but look at it. And how many immature males are going to look like that? So this is a problem just like the, the American Red Star, this one. This is a problem with sex, not with um, necessarily males, although some people might have problems with fall males. I, I, I don't know. Let's take a look. Um, okay, so here's a first fall male. Yeah, look what happens to that yellow. It's gone. It still has the wing bars. All right, if we go back. Um, so you see, this doesn't look too dissimilar. I don't know. I'm going to say I don't know whether that's spring or fall. But what do you see here? You see what it's starting as, um, as first fall. So this is the September after it hatched. Okay, but look at this color. You have to be really careful of this because so many warblers might be sporting this color at this time. And I love to see these things again, these back stripes. Okay. 
just an interesting look at that bird. This is not so much a challenge as it is just differentiating between the two different uh, groups. So um, Joan's photograph of a kind of a ticked off Western palm warbler. You know the color rate, it is a Western, I believe, right? Is that a Western? Yeah, the, the coloration differences, right? Fall. Again, what do you see here that you could get confused with? If you make a rash judgment, if you quickly judge, oh, that's a yellow rumped warbler. Well, it's got streaks, doesn't it? Doesn't have any windbirds. It's got a brown head, but it's not. And then our yellow breeding, which is really pretty. And then the fall again. Okay, so not so confusing as just knowing the differences. And on Christmas bird counts, if you're if you're gonna participate in one, you can see both of those. Um, birds. Okay, this is Joan's favorite warbler, Joelle's favorite warbler. They like this warbler more than any other warbler because by the end of October, that's all we'll see sometimes. I have a St. Francis of Assisi moment when I was uh, volunteering out in the park in 2000, um, right before the Park Service hired me, I was out there and I had learned what fishing was. So I was out there, psh, 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 it was probably about November 10th or 15th, which is my favorite times to be out in Barataria. And I was just inundated with yellow rumped warblers. I mean, there must have been a hundred. They're very inquisitive, they react to fishing, and you will be tired of them by April because they fly in like the end of October and they don't leave until uh, end of April. But they do, when they come to us in the winter, they're not very pretty. This, I happen to be um, partial to, is the Western, the Audubon's yellow rumped. And again, we get both of them. You could be on Grand Isle and see both groups. And this is ours, frankly, I don't think ours holds a candle to the uh, Audubon, but you know. So a myrtle, breeding myrtle, these two, and then a breeding Audubon's. I mean, she, she's even pretty, right? But then here we are. So you can't go by the bump, the yellow butter button. Birders call these butter butts for obvious reasons. You can't go by that because, uh, all right. So you have to identify which is which. And if you'll notice, again, if you know that the Audubon's has that yellowish throat, some retain that yellowish throat in the fall, right? Not all, but some do. Okay, and then you still get the, you know, you're going to get yellow patches on the flanks. Okay, again, don't go by the butt. That's not going to necessarily tell you. Okay, go by some of the other characteristics. Moving along, the not so challenging magnolia warbler. I don't find it to be too terribly challenging, but it could be because I'm used to seeing them. So here we have an immature, here we have a fall male, but you notice some of the same characteristics. That yellow, 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 the, the, the streaks will fade a bit, right? They'll, uh, they won't be as strong, you'll still see some, but this is what you wanna notice, it's that tail. Right, that white band in the tail, so black, white, black. And now, at this time of the year, if you go to Couture, like it happened this morning, um, we were looking at one like this, of course, and that was what was flashed, and immediately I knew what it was. Okay, so just a challenge here, three females. Um, I'll tell you, yellow rumped. We didn't talk about this one because it doesn't really, it's not much of a challenge, but this is a female pine warbler. Pine warblers like to be in pine trees, but that's not going to prevent a female yellow rump from going in one. This is a female black burning, and don't look at these. These are twigs. Look at these. There you have it. Well, look at these things. Are this, is this not confounding for folks starting out? Again, though. No. Notice your field markings and, and study your books and it won't be as bad. Again, more females. Butter, but oh that's a that's a yellow rump. No. Okay, that is. Female Kate May Warbler. That what one of the first birds I showed you, Joan's picture with the orange patch on its face. Ooh. Okay, so you could 
I can see why people might be confused. All right, so let's close things up a little bit, uh, talking about feeding uh, warblers. Warblers are not like other birds in, the, in that most warblers are insectiv insect insectivorous. God, I can never say that. Um, so most warblers will just keep eating insects, especially in the breeding season. But that doesn't mean you can't forego native plants. And those of you who know me, you know I have in the last two years become a native plant freak. So we want to think trees. We think warblers. We want to think trees. I just got done listening to Doug Tallamy, whose book you will want to get. I'll share that book with you in a bit. Oak trees, doesn't matter what kind of oak trees, host 556 species of caterpillar and moth. Moth. Cat, uh, 556 species of moth and butterfly caterpillars. Black willow, uh, yellow warblers love black willows. Yellow warblers, I love willows, period. In Glacier Park in Montana, I, when I'm not afraid of bears, I sit there and watch the yellow warblers in the willow trees because they just love the willow trees. And obviously pine, this is a loblolly pine, um, pine warblers. But a good place to see um, black willow trees and who likes to go in it in the spring also is again on the Coquille Trail. Okay, so there are warblers who will eat berries. I know you're thinking I'm mad and you're entitled to think that, but there are some vines that you want to keep in your property. Now, I don't think that in my small postage stamp property in Metairie this would work, but those of you who live across a lake or you live on the Bachelor or you live somewhere great, you have room for things like Virginia creeper without it spoiling things. But warblers, again, love their insects, but some will consume berries in the fall. They eat berries in, in, in the winter. I've seen warblers eating uh, berries in Costa Rica. I've seen them eating them in, in Ecuador. So in the winter, they will eat berries, but some eat them here. Pokeweed, I know we all have this really bad ideas of pokeweed, but it's great. Warblers will eat them. Um, pine warblers are known to eat pokeweed berries. Yellow rump, prothonotary, yellow warblers, even Nashville uh, warblers. Virginia creeper feeds all kinds of birds, but again, the same. Okay, Nashville's. And, um, poison ivy. I like Bill Fontenot when he tells people not to get rid of their poison ivy. Of course, Bill Fontenot's got a lot of land, but the warblers love those berries. And then hackberries. Today, yesterday, I think uh, Joan and I were looking at warblers in hackberry trees, and they will eat those berries. So your hackberries are good. Also, your hummingbird feeders. Uh, Orange Crown, Tennessee, Nashville, uh, Black Throat of Greens, Yellows, they all go to, they will go to, they have been seen at hummingbird feeders. I have seen Orange Crown at my hummingbird feeders. Um, this fall, also, I had yellow warblers eating my elderberries. I came out to take the garbage out. I looked up. There was a yellow warbler eating on my elderberries. So, you know, it happens. The biggest and the most storied relationship is between wax myrtle and yellow rump warblers. Because yeah, yellow rumps, again, all of our favorite warbler. And folks, I, 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 I don't want to make it seem, war, these warblers are fine. It's just they're so plentiful. <clears throat> this is an interesting warbler, actually, much like the, <coughs> the pine warbler, the palm warbler, the orange crown warbler, and this yellow rump. They don't go all the way south to Central America or the Caribbean. They stay on the Gulf Coast in Florida, Mississippi, Texas, Louisiana. But the yellow rump is the one bird that can easily digest that waxy coating. If you've ever peeled the powder part of wax myrtle berry, you know, that they can digest that uh, waxy coating. So they, they will eat that. And I think that's kind of why I had that St. Francis moment, because I was among the wax myrtles right there near the end of Bayou Coquille Trail when all hundred of those birds came out. Um, but let's not forget our natives, our native flowers right now. And by the way, I'm going to send you to some uh, resources for native plants. 
all native bloomers in the fall are still attracting your hoverflies, your tachnid flies, your bees, um, even butterflies. So while we're not worried necessarily about caterpillars anymore, we are still seeing, um, I had uh, soldier beetles on my, um, my bone set the other day. Great food, okay? So these are just some, I put Drummond's asters because I love Drummond's asters. I mean, how often do we go out somewhere and we see them even up until Thanksgiving blooming those beautiful little blooms. Um, snake root, great pollinator plant, incredibly potent pollinator plant. However, it's poisonous for mammals, so mm, double-edged sword. The ageratum, ageratum, it's great. Bees, not so much for butterflies, but different species of bees. Bone set, um, any kind of goldenrod. I like seaside goldenrod. You don't have to be by the sea. Actually, this is in Wisconsin, in the prairie of Wisconsin. There are no seas in this millennium, I don't think, in Wisconsin. But uh, frostweed, which is just about to start to bloom and frostweed blooms well until November too. Many of these will bloom well into uh, October, into November, still attracting those bugs. And one thing I wanted to tell you is my frostweed last fall bloomed up until about mid-November and the bees were still coming to it and I had orange crown warblers off and overhead. <clears throat> and I thought, well, oh, it would be so cool to catch an orange crown warbler nabbing something off that. Um, okay, so great sources for native plants and forgivorous birds. Obviously, I will, I will point you to the guru, the man. Um, before I knew Doug Tallamy's name, I knew Bill Fontenot. Um, he is the guy. This is on our website on uh, jjaudubon.net. This is a great list of fruiting plants for birds. And he doesn't just focus on warblers, he focuses on all species of birds. Um, so I would, I, that's easily accessible. You can also purchase from him his book, Native Gardening in the South, which I consider the Bible. Um, I was actually looking at it yesterday because I just bought my first spice bush, uh, bush that I'm going to plant. Um, Bringing Nature Home is Doug, is Doug Tallamy's first book, and it really is an awesome book, and obviously, here we go. Um, I heard him speak tonight, and he's really very good, but Bringing Nature Home um, is a very, very instructional, helpful, accessible book. He is an entomologist at the University of Delaware, I believe. And he is one who has authored, helped co-authored the studies on chickadees and their caterpillar consumptions. And then our very own Charlotte Seidenberg. Again, before I knew Doug Tallamy, I knew Bill Fontenot and Charlotte Seidenberg. I've had this book for years, so I'm not sure if it's still available on Amazon. Of course, I haven't looked. This is a great book because Charlotte does a really good job of explaining the necessity of layers in your garden, trees to understory trees, to shrubs, to ground covers and things like that. So the wildlife garden, very good, okay? Of course, also there's the National Audubon Society Society's webpage where you can get on and put in your zip code and it'll spit back to you uh, plants and for those of us, whether it's 70119 or 7005, it's going to give you essentially the same sorts of plants. But it, it's worth looking at. It's, it's good. National Audubon has done a very good job on its Plants for Birds mission. Um, I've been behind it, uh, been pushing it. We've had some really serious changes brought on by COVID to Louisiana Audubon, but still we are pushing the Plants for Birds. I know Jane Patterson in Baton Rouge is very instrumental in, in pushing it too. Okay, so local sources for native plants, finishing up here. Delta Flora Native Plant Nursery at 2710 Turo Street. Lise Hopkins uh, is the propri proprietor. Lise has got a great spread. Um, from Lise, this past Saturday, I bought um, a, my spice bush. She's also got oak leaf hydrangea, which is a native hydrangea, if you like. She's, uh, Lise rather has all kinds of things. Um, Delta Flora carries 
plants for wetlands. Delta flora carries plants on trees. She at uh, least had mulberry trees um, there. Pelican greenhouse weekend plant sales. You know, they're um, trying to boost so city parks budget. So they're having weekend sales now instead of monthly sales. And I'll tell you, it's so much easier because you can go in and not be bothered with, you know, waiting in line for an hour and a half. Um, Linda Alt, though she sells primarily butterfly uh, uh, pollinating plants, uh, natives, she's, these are still bee attractants, uh, other insect attractants. I am very happy to say that almost Eden plants is okay. I have um, just ordered, ordered a snake root plant and some more adoratum from him. Um, he, John, is in Maryville, Louisiana, which was hit partly by Laura, but they're doing well. They just, I still believe they don't have water still. Um, my husband and I, on a wild hair, took a drive out there to Maryville, which is four hours, much to poor Michael's dismay, four hours away, um, he says, to pick up $40 worth of plants. But it was a great road trip, and you get to see the nursery, and it's really, but he's only mail order, unless you live close by or you want to drive. And then finally, native plant organizations you might be interested in. Um, the uh, Native Plant Initiative of Greater New Orleans kind of had a bit of a um, confusion today. Um, we had a giveaway today for mallows. I'm not sure how many people showed up because I didn't get the memo that we were going to do it because it wasn't raining. But Tuesday next week, we are giving away more na uh, native mallows um, for free. Uh, we have four or five species. I don't, well, I shouldn't say because I don't think we have many pine land hibiscus left. Um, but we do have a lot of halberd leaf uh, hibiscuses and salt marsh hibiscuses and things like that. And then the, and then again, these are all free. Native Plant uh, Society of Louisiana, um, of which I am the newsletter editor of. Um, um, we have, <laughs> we have a convention conference in February. Whether or not that will happen this year, we don't know. Anyway, so I have given for you here some things you might want to invest in. Here's the warbler guide with your beautiful parallel there on the cover. And then uh, Peterson's guide um, on the right, if that's your fancy. And then iBird Pro, which is a great app. I love it. I use it. Um, um, one interesting thing about it, however, if you do travel out of state and you plan on using your iBird Pro, I know for a fact in McGee Marsh, you will be reprimanded. Um, when, when you are going to northern places where birds are um, breeding, callback is not allowed. I found that out the hard way. And um, <laughs> So you want to be careful of that. If ever we meet in, in private, I could tell you how I was reprimanded and who reprimanded me. But anyway, um, so, but iBird Pro does have good photographs. It has range maps. It's got everything on it. I purchased it, it was 1995. I don't know how much it is now. Um, and it takes, it took me a while to download, but my phone was so much older when I did it. So that's all I have for you tonight. I will be happy to entertain questions that I am capable of answering. Otherwise, I will send them over to Jennifer. Are there any questions?